Our reading comes from 1 Timothy chapter 3, 8 through 13. That's 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy or filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in the pure conscience, and let these also be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slander, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacon be a husband of one wife, ruling their children and their, ha their own house as well. I'm glad to see all of you here tonight. Our crowd's a little smaller. You know, Joe this morning mentioned our young men and their song leading and their willingness to get up and lead in the assembly. And well, tonight, John Richardson is preaching at the pilot congregation. And so the Richardsons are there. And I think several other families are there tonight with the pilot congregation. We're, of course, really appreciate pilot as a congregation and all the support they've given us over the years for the paper and things like that. But I think the third Wednesday, the third Sunday night of each month, I think one of our men or young men goes out there to preach. And so that's wonderful, and I'm glad that the guys are willing to do that. But our numbers are a little down here, but that's okay. We know where they are and appreciate their John's willingness and then those who go to support John and whoever else goes out there to do that. We talked for some time about the list of qualifications for elders, and then last Sunday night we looked at the work of elders. And tonight we're going to move on to the deacons. And it's interesting because there's not nearly as much in Scripture about deacons as there is in, uh, as there is in Scripture about elders. And just starting off in terms of definition, the word deacon, it's, a, it's one of those words that we call a transliteration. In other words, they take the letters from one language and just pull it over into letters of the new language. Greek to English. The Greek word is diakonos. You can hear it, can't you? It's a deacon. You know, there are many people identified in Scripture as deacons. Jesus came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Well, that's the Greek word for deacon, the verb form. There's a verb form and a noun form. It's a minister or a servant, one who attends to the needs of another. In Romans chapter 13, when Paul's talking about the governing authorities, he says they are God's minister. You know what word that is? Deacon. So there are obvious, and there are several others, Paul refers to himself in that, in that term as a deacon. So what we need to understand when we study this topic is that there are times when this term is used in a sense of just that, one who is a minister, one who is a servant of others, like Jesus, like Paul, like our civil government, civil authorities. But then there's a, there's a biblical text that addresses what we, what we might refer to as the technical term or the... the as it says there, uh, what verse is it? Verse 10, let them use the office of a deacon. So maybe perhaps like an official term in, in line with the different works in the church. A deacon is a minister or a servant. So what is a deacon? Well, a deacon is one who, who is to help or to serve the bishops in the functioning of the local body of Christ. Maybe that, and I've thought about this a lot in, in terms of this particular topic, maybe that's why there's not so much given to us about deacons in Scripture. We have their qualifications, but their work is to serve at the discretion of the eldership. Well, the eldership has certain, obviously, qualifications, certain works that we looked at last week in a variety of passages. But, you know, God has given us a lot of freedom to serve. And let me, let me illustrate that for you. There are, there are folks within churches of Christ who say things like, I've heard this before, well, it's a sin for a congregation to have a youth minister. Or they'll say, that there are some folks who believe it's a sin for a congregation to take their funds and build a kitchen and a fellowship hall. And they'll, they'll ask a question like, well, where does Scripture authorize youth ministry? Where does Scripture authorize me, uh, meeting at a... At a sacred place like the church building and eating in a fellowship hall. Well, 
you know, you don't have to have a thou shalt and a thou shalt not for every single thing. We talked about this in our young adults class this morning. You remember when Paul's talking about the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Paul talks about several things that are the works of the flesh. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness. Has a whole list of things. But then he has this little phrase in verse 21 that says, and such like. You don't have to have a thou shalt or a thou shalt not. The Lord has authorized us to do the work of the church in an organized, in a structural manner. Remember, we looked at Philippians 1.1 a couple of times. Paul, to the, saints in, uh, to the saints in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. We have that structure that's laid out in Scripture for a local congregation to function in that way. But then, well, what specific works is it supposed to do? Well, the, the, the church is to evangelize and the church is to... We think of these three areas, evangelism, edification, and benevolence. Well, how do you do all those things? You do them to, your, to, to, the, to the, what I would say, the, the discretion of the local eldership. And obviously, you, don't, you wouldn't do things that violate scriptural principles or scriptural commands, but there is a lot, my point is, there is a lot of freedom that is allowed to serve the local congregation, to serve the community around the local congregation. So there's not a whole lot of detail given to us about deacons. We know their qualifications, and we know what the word means. And so essentially, I look at that and I think, go at it. We know how a congregation is to be led, how a congregation is to be functioning. Let's get to work. Again, that's the idea of this term here, a minister or a servant. So that's, I think that's a good working definition of a deacon. Those who help or serve the bishops in the functioning of the local body of Christ. And we'll, we'll look at some details here in just a minute. The qualifications are not obviously nearly as detailed, as lengthy as that of an eldership. Some of them, in fact, overlap. And so we'll just pay attention to those quickly. Not greedy of filthy lucre. We've talked about that in terms of the eldership. He must be blameless. We talked about that in terms of the eldership. So we're not going to... We're not going to recover ground that we've already looked at. But there are some unique things uh, in this section. So 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 8. Must be. Well, what does that mean? We've talked about that. This is not optional. This is not a list of suggestions. This is what a deacon, a man who would serve as a deacon must be. He must be a dignified or a venerable, a respectable man. That's what this word grave means. The New King James uses that word Reverend. So this is descriptive of his overall, you might say, his demeanor, how he conducts himself in the world. That's not hard to understand. The, the deacon is not double-tongued. Now, when, again, when you look at, th this is unique. This is not included in the qualifications of elders, but an elder can't be double-tongued either because to be double-tongued is to be deceitful in your words. A double-tongued person would be a person who would say one thing to one person and something completely different on the same subject to somebody else uh, might fall under the category of hypocrisy to some extent. But a deacon can't be this. If he's, if he's serving under the leadership of the eldership and he's trying to assist or to attend to the functioning of the local body, he can't be a deceitful individual. There's no room for that. And deacons, by the way, their qualifications, just like elders, this goes for all Christians, doesn't it? No Christian needs to be double-tongued, needs to be deceitful in his or her words, not given to much wine. Now that sounds a little different than it does for elders, doesn't it? And we want to go off course a lot of times and, and discuss what does that particularly mean, and that's a discussion we need to have. The phrase literally means one whose attention is not held by this. There are two groups of people in Scripture. I want you to think about this. So in terms of elders, you have not given to wine. In terms of Christianity in general, and we looked at this when we studied it under the, under the qualifications of elders, Christians are told to be sober, aren't they? Repeatedly throughout Scripture. Christians are, are admonished against drinking in any amount because the, the, the contrast is you're either filled with the Spirit or you're full, filled with wine. That's Ephesians 5.18. You cannot be a little bit of both. But it's interesting because here's where people go off the deep end. Well, it says not given to much wine. That means they can drink a little. You know, there's another group of people in Scripture of whom the same thing is said. Turn over just a couple of pages. Look over at Titus chapter 2. Titus 
Titus 2 and verse 3. Paul's here addressing the church in Crete where he's left Titus. And he's addressing the aged men, the aged women, the young men and the young women. Titus 2, 3. The aged women likewise that they be in behavior, notice, as becometh holiness. Everything else is going to fall under that description. Well, what does that look like? Not false accusers. Not given to much wine. That's the same exact phrase that we find in re reference to deacons. If this means, hear me out. If this means it's okay for deacons to drink, but just don't get drunk, then it means the same thing for elderly ladies. So the only people who are permitted to drink in Scripture, if this is what we're going to do, if this is the rabbit we're going to chase, the only folks in Scripture that can drink are elderly women and deacons. Does that make any sense whatsoever? Why not the elderly men? Why can't they drink? Why not elders? There, there is no proper situation in which this can apply like that. Where one group of people can do this and it's considered sinful if they do, but then another group is restricted from it. I think we kind of miss the point sometimes in this discussion. Well, what's the point? What's the point of living the Christian life? Well, a passage I think of is like Colossians chapter 3. If ye then be risen with Christ, this is Colossians 3.1, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above and not on things of the earth. That's my Christian life in general. Why would I want to do anything that would alter my state of mind, and if I continue in it, that would alter my physical functioning like this? We... It's not just about what we do as Christians. It's also about why do we do it? And why, do, why would we want to seek to do something like this? It's not, this is not permission for, de for deacons to drink a little. This is a prohibition. It doesn't hold your attention. This is not part of who you are. And it goes along with everything else in here. What's the next one? This, one, this one's interesting because this is, it's, it's similar to what... Um, what Paul told Titus in Titus chapter 1 about holding fast the form of sound words to elders. But notice what he says here. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. So I thought about that for a while, how I would, how I would define that, how we would look at that. The word mystery is used 22 times in your Bible. And most often, I didn't count how many times this is referenced, but most often in the New Testament, the mystery is a reference to God's establishing the kingdom of heaven on earth and how Jews and Gentiles would be one in the body of Christ. You read that, for instance, take some time and read the first part of Ephesians chapter 3. And Paul talks about the mystery of the gospel he preached. And he's talking about the Jews and Gentiles are now one in one body. They're, they're not separated by that wall, that, that partition that stood between them. That was taken out of the way. It was a mystery. It was something not known until it was revealed. And it was revealed by the preaching of the gospel. So let's run over to Galatians chapter 2. This is a passage that I thought of to help us understand what does it mean for a deacon that he hold the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. See, a lot of times, and you've heard me say this before, deacons have been relegated to junior elders. Deacons have been relegated to, well, if I do this well, one day I'll become an elder. It's, it's, and it's been treated as if it were like a rung on the ladder of success in the church. And that is absolutely incorrect. And you've heard me say in this series of lessons that the way we've done it in the church over the years is, well, if this person's a good deacon, maybe one day he'll be a good elder, as if being a deacon is just that, just a stepping stone in the progress of, of um, a person's personal spiritual growth. And that is completely wrong. It's a complete misunderstanding of what a deacon is. So Galatians 2, beginning in verse 11 when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that, certain came, uh, came from James. He did eat with the Gentiles. Peter. Peter would eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, the Jews, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled, dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their the King James says dissimulation. The New King James, I like better, says hypocrisy. They were acting hypocritically. 
and the other Jews dissembled like that. Uh, verse 14, but when I saw that they, and here's, here's what we're talking about, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Verse 14, but when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. That's what it means to hold the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. That an individual is going to walk uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. Because throughout the New Testament, the gospel is referred to as the mystery of the faith. So Peter wasn't walking uprightly. I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles. If you're going to claim to be a person of God and, and yet live like a, like a heathen. And not as do the Jews. Why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as, the, as do the Jews? Why would you try to convince somebody to become a Christian when you yourself are living like a non-Christian? That's his point. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. That's what it means to walk, or rather to hold the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. You walk according to the truth of the gospel. You, you don't live one way in front of one group of people and live another way in front of another group of people. You live a consistent life. And this is... I mean, who are we talking about here? We're talking about Peter, who is baptized with the Holy Spirit. And, you know, we have his sermon recorded in Acts 2 and in Acts 3. And he wrote two books of your New Testament, which tells me, by the way, and this is kind of a side note, that a person who was baptized in the Holy Spirit, it didn't change his personality. So many people today, and I've even heard this within churches of Christ, when you're baptized, the Holy Spirit will dwell with you and he will empower you to live the Christian life. Well, then what happened with Peter? If that's what happens, then what happened with Peter? And if that's what happens, if, if when I'm baptized, the Holy Spirit comes into me and changes me and enables me to live the Christian life, then what happens when I sin? Is that the Holy Spirit's fault? And it's like we have this discussion about that. And when we do good, that's the Holy Spirit's fault. When we do bad, no, that's our own fault. We need to make up our mind. And, and frankly, what that is is Calvinism. It's, it's just it's not true. To hold the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience is to walk according to the truth of the gospel. That applies to every Christian. Notice next, back to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Let these also first be proved, then let them serve. Remember, one of the qualifications of an elder was not a novice, right? Lest he be lifted up with pride and fall into the same condemnation of the devil. No different for a deacon. Let it be proved, tested, to see if they are worthy to be a deacon. Because there are qualifications that you have to meet. Well, notice the phrase here. It's like an like a if-then proposition. Let them be tested, then let them use the office of a deacon. That's a long phrase there. Let them use the office of a deacon. It's one word in the Greek. Then let them serve. What it means, what it says. Serve as what? Well, obviously serve as deacons. Being found blameless, which that's up there at the top of the list. This idea, when I look at a phrase like that, when I look at verse 9, I look at verse 10, and then what we'll talk about here in just a minute. Again, this idea that deacons, their only purpose is to maintain a physical plant, to serve in that capacity, and that's it. That's not scriptural. Now, they can do that because they're serving at the discretion of the local eldership. Absolutely. But I think sometimes we, in our minds, we have pictured that that's, that's all a deacon does. You know, if we got some paint that needs to be done or it's just, you know, hey, get a deacon to serve in that capacity. When these men are spiritual leaders. Now, they're not over the congregation as the elders are, but they're men who hold the mystery of the faith. And they have to be first tested to see if they are worthy. And then they serve as deacons. They minister to the local congregation. You have their domestic responsibilities in verse 12. And again, remember we talked about this. This is so controversial, isn't it, today? Only a male can serve as deacons. So let me show you this real quick. Because this, I've had this discussion with folks even within the church. Let's go to Romans chapter 16. And the first couple of verses there, Romans 16. You know, Christians are looked at as backward, out of date, misogynistic, bigoted. You know, what, 
whatever pejoratives you can think of, that's the way Christians are viewed, especially in regard to the role of women. We're so out of date. Women should be able to serve in every capacity that a man can serve. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church at Sincrea, that you receive her in the Lord as becometh saints. The, the implication is that Paul wrote this letter and sent it by her hand uh, to the church at Rome. A sister in whatsoever business she has need of you, for she has been uh, a succorer, the King James says, of many and of myself also. She's come to the aid of a lot of people over the years. Well, you know, that's not unusual in Scripture. We see many female servants of God's throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament, and I would say even you know, throughout the centuries, even in the church today. But she's called a servant here. Well, you know what that word is? It's the feminine form of deacon. So people, those who are what's called, there's, and I, I shared this with you a couple years ago in a sermon. There's a website that is dedicated to the, what's called the egalitarian movement within the churches of Christ. Egalitarian is the idea of, of, of full equality between males and females. And that, that, that females can serve in every capacity that men can serve. Preachers, elders, and deacons, leaders in worship, etc. And they have jumped on this idea that Phoebe is a deaconess. Well, that's the word that's used there. But how else is that word used in Scripture? Jesus was called a deacon. Jesus was never married. And Jesus lived before the church was established, right? Paul is called a deacon. Uh, yet he was never married. Our civil authorities are deacons. It's, it's the word. It's not the definition of the term. Phoebe was not a, a what we would call a, the, the official position of a deacon within the church. She was a servant of the church. And by the way, back to 1 Timothy 3.12, the deacons must be the husband of one wife. This, is not, this has nothing to do with, with the church's view on the superiority of males and the inferiority of females. It has nothing to do with that. If we want to know what it has to do with, we need to re read 1 Timothy chapter 2 and about verses 13 and 14. It's about the order of creation and about the deception that happened in the garden. That's what it has to do with. Only men can be deacons. But that's, you know, that's a, that's a very harsh thing to say these days, isn't it? Ruling their children and their own house as well. And we talked extensively about that under the study of the eldership. Look at the reward, 1 Timothy 3.13. For they that have used the office of a deacon well might one day become an elder. I keep, I keep emphasizing that, and I'm doing that for a reason, because that's what I've seen throughout the years. It's in hopes that one day he'll be something bigger and better and more important. But that's not at all what Scripture says. They that have used the office of a deacon well, well deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. There's no looking for a promotion here. They're serving as the ministers of the local congregation, serving under the, over, uh, under the oversight of the local bishops. They're not looking to advance in their career. They use it well, and they obtain what it says there, a good degree and great boldness in the faith. They've proved themselves that they are this type of an individual. They meet these qualifications, and they're serving the local church. Well, you say, well, what? okay, so then what is the work of a deacon? A lot of folks go to Acts chapter 6. If you want to turn over there, you're, well, obviously you're welcome to do that. In Acts chapter 6, you have this instance where the church is growing, and you have a daily, well, the, the, way, the, the way the King James says it, a daily ministration. There, there were those in need, and they needed people to, to meet the needs of those who had the needs. The apostle said, it's not reasonable that we should leave the preaching of the gospel and go and serve tables. You guys take it upon yourselves, find seven individuals. Notice what it says here in Acts chapter 6 and verse 3. Brethren, look ye out from among yourselves seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. And so some people say, well, that, this is talking about the first deacons in the church. I personally... That's fine. I, don't, I can't tell anybody they're wrong for saying that. I don't particularly believe that because the list of qualifications is quite different, isn't it? 
But the point being, there are different functions within the church. The apostle's job was to fulfill the Great Commission. You guys can find somebody among you to take care of this other business. And so they do that. And so people will say, well, Acts chapter 6 is the example of the work of deacons. Okay, I suppose it could very well be that. Serving the local church, those who are in need, um, dealing with financial situations, things like that. Whatever, here's the point. The work of a deacon is whatever the bishops deem necessary to accomplish locally. And, and other, than, other than that, there, there are no guidelines given in Scripture. What they do is defined by their term, deacon, their ministers, their servants, their attendants. They are those who wait on the needs of others. So whatever the bishops deem, deem necessary to be done, you appoint those men to, to accomplish that work. You think about us locally, what do we do? Well, we've got a property to keep up. That would be something good for someone to do. Somebody needs to do it. And so oftentimes deacons are appointed to that type of work. But that's not all that they should be doing. Let's say it that way. They're not just relegated to fixing something broken at the building. These are spiritual men. Well, they should be spiritual men. Could be financial issues. Again, if you want to use Acts chapter 6 as an example, that's a, that would serve as a good example. But again, that's whatever the, the, the bishops deem necessary be accomplished. Perhaps the organization of worship. You think about how things are done here. Um, and in other places... You have, uh, I think you have on the back of your bulletin, the deacon in charge or something like that. And there's a deacon each month that makes sure that those who are um, lined up, lined out to lead worship are here. And if not, find substitutes. That's something worthy that needs to be done. Bible class materials, Bible class teachers, efforts with and for our young people. There are a lot of things that can be done by these men. But the point is this, again, well, I'm in Acts chapter 6. Let me get back to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Here's the point. You have these qualifications that are very specific. Those who have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. They are ministers of the church. I'm very much aware of how we use the term minister today. Oftentimes the word, and you'll see it on church signs and things like this, minister so and so. But you know, every Christian is a minister. Because a minister is a servant, and every Christian is a servant. Bishops are servants, deacons are servants. Every Christian is a minister of Jesus Christ. And a minister of their, I would say, their fellow Christian and their fellow man. But if a man wants to serve as a deacon, he has qualifications to meet and he has work to be done. But again, you kind of see the structural organization of the church. You have the, those who are out in front, those who rule over us, Hebrews chapter 13. And then you have those who serve the needs of the local church. And it's a worthy work. That's, that's one thing that, that I want to be sure to emphasize and to, to encourage our current deacons and perhaps future deacons to remember. You don't become a deacon hoping one day to become something better. You're serving the church in a, in a way that is, that is needed. And that's a good thing. And use it well because you'll, you'll have a reward for that. It's kind of like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, Verse 58, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That applies to every Christian, doesn't it? So whatever you do as a Christian, whether you're an elder, a deacon, Bible class teacher, you, your, your name's on the, on the uh, food committee sheet out front, whatever you do, do it well. Because whatever you do in service to God is not in vain. It's not empty. Because one day he's coming back and He will reward the faithful. And that's what we're looking forward to. It may be that there's somebody here tonight who is not yet a Christian. You know, the Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 3 that those that, that um, we are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, for as many of us have been, as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. It may be that there's somebody here tonight who needs to be baptized into Christ. We'll do whatever we can to help you. If you have questions about that, we'll be happy to sit down and help answer those questions for you from the Bible. Maybe you're here tonight and you are a person who has done that in the past, but you've not remained a faithful servant. Again, every Christian is a servant. Well, we want you to come back. We want you to be involved in the local work here and do whatever you can in your service to God and, and, to, and to one another. So if there's a need to respond tonight, let's take